Good morning. It is a joyful day to, uh, for me to, to look up and, and see some faces here in the beautiful sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church of Easton and to welcome folks online as well. This is the day that the Lord has made and we are abundantly uh, pleased to be in worship today. Um, I would like to make a few announcements. I'll mention first of all that um, Elizabeth is not here to sing for us today and I'm sure those of you who are here um, and even at home um, will be sad to hear that. Uh, she is simply on a family trip. Um, it had to be postponed from last week because um, their family had a, a few medical issues to deal with. Poor Ella had her wisdom teeth removed and Peter had to have surgery. So um, they are traveling this weekend and we wish them traveling mercies. So we will welcome Elizabeth back next Sunday when she will sing for us um, and lead us in worship. We are indeed in hybrid. Um, we are, uh, we have still room to welcome more folks. If um, anyone would like to join us, they are welcome to come on Sunday mornings. And we will also continue to um, share the worship service online as we have been. So um, we're glad to be able to do that. Also, um, we are, in, we are uh, in the season of Pentecost. We're moving towards the season of Pentecost. And um, that is the, the season when we celebrate the gifts and talents that the Spirit gives us. Um, even, even time is a gift. So if you have time on Sunday mornings to come a little early and to be an usher, we would surely appreciate that. So um, if you would call our office and let us know, we welcome having more ushers on Sunday mornings. And uh, also, we have a basket here in front of us. Uh, if you have brought pasta today, you're welcome to put it here in our basket or to come on Tuesday in the parking lot um, so that we can again fill the pantry at um, Project. And we are the pasta church, but we've added peanut butter to the wish list. Uh, they are in need of peanut butter, so pasta and peanut butter. Um, our other announcement has to do with this lovely weather that we're in, and we've had, gosh, we've had sunshine and rain um, just this morning, so um, we're in that season of, of weather changes in the spring, and it's a good time for us to attend a little bit to our outside of the sanctuary. So um, on May 8th uh, from 9.30 to noon, if you would like to come and work in the garden, uh, we welcome you to do that. It can either be out front or in the back. Um, our property team will be around to um, help direct folks. So again, if you have the time uh, and the inclination to do some weed pulling and to beautify our outs outside of our, of our congregation's building, we welcome you to do that. And as I mentioned, we are moving into the season of Pentecost, and we have begun to be a church that supports the Pentecost offering. And one of the nice things about this uh, Presbytery-wide offering is that it does support children, and um, that is a beautiful uh, ministry to support in the Pentecost season. So if you are able, um, we welcome you making a donation and you will be receiving a, um, a little bank, a little Pentecost bank, and um, some offering envelopes in the mail in the coming week or so, along with your May soundings. So please look forward to that. And if you are not on our mailing list, um, or you are not on our email list, please um, contact our church office, and we would love to include you. I believe those are my announcements this morning. You are always welcome to um, contact the church to uh, purchase a mask if, if you would like. Um, I, th I have to keep being reminded not to turn mine upside down. Um, so uh, that is my last announcement. And in, on May 16th, we'll have virtual fellowship. Indeed, I'm looking at my screen here <laughs> that is reminding me, and I think that is it. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, just a few prayer concerns. Um, this week, um, Gladys Milheim's daughter reached out to us to let us know that she is not doing well. 
Um, she's had kind of an up and down uh, season over the last month or, or plus, and um, they thought it's time that the congregation know and include Gladys in our prayers. Um, she's now living with her daughter. Um, she's 93, and um, so we offer our best prayers for her well-being. As I mentioned that, I'd also like to ask your prayers um, for the Wilsons. Um, Nancy Wilson received the terrible, you never like to hear that you are diagnosed with cancer, um, and she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, and you can imagine what that, what that does for her, and um, she's the main caregiver for Bud Wilson and for their whole family. Um, keep them in your prayers. Those are my announcements and prayers requests this morning, friends. And so I will now invite us to worship God together. And for folks here, they are being very good and wearing their masks, even though they are socially distanced. And we appreciate that. Um, we look forward to a day soon, we hope, when we will even not require our masks when we're gathering together. And, um, and we look forward to the day when we will sing loudly together. Today, um, if you would like to uh, just sing quietly along, um, you are welcome to do that. If you'd like to recite the prayers um, in the bulletin, you're welcome to do that. Um, and of course, if you are home, you can shout to the rooftops. So um, please join your hearts with mine as we are called um, to worship God. We gather in the name of the risen Lord. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We gather as siblings of the resurrected one. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We, share, we gather to share our faith and to worship God. Christ is risen. Alleluia. We gather to proclaim the good news of Easter. Christ is risen. Alleluia. join your hearts with mine in this morning's prayer of confession. We use a lot of words, gracious God, but do little to turn them into deeds. Instead of being of one heart and soul, we choose sides and form groups of folks just like us. Blessed with great grace, we have trouble sharing it with those who need it the most. Forgive us, God of love. Forgive us as we step out of the shadows into your light. Restore us as we reveal our brokenness. Hear us as we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and our God.
Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, believe the good news. Christ has heard your prayer. You have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Scripture reading today is Acts 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave the testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, O Lord, be acceptable. You are Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. So friends, when I was a little girl, um, there were a lot, of, a lot of little kids on our block, a bunch of little kids. And two houses down from my house was a little church, a small non-denominational church. And, and the fact that they're a church isn't really important to my story. What's important is that this little building had steps and a paved sidewalk, so it was flat. It even wrapped around a telephone pole. This was the perfect place for, the, for us as the neighborhood kids, the little kids, to play. What would we play? How many steps before the queen? Does anybody know that game? You don't know that game? How about red light, green light? You know that one? Freeze tag. You know that one. The telephone pole made the perfect home base, and that flat sidewalk was perfect for running. And as little kids, we weren't allowed to cross or go into the street, so that's what we needed. As I think about those days, I realized that our games didn't have teams. You never knew who might just be out that afternoon. And our games didn't have fixed players, again, because Johnny might have a dentist appointment. And you know, we didn't really have an end to our games either. When one round of tag was over, another one would begin again. What was important was not who won or lost, but that everybody got their turn. Because some kids liked chasing, and some kids liked to be chased. You can decide which one you liked. I don't know how I learned these games, probably from my older sister. And I don't remember the rules being etched in stone. We would, we would let the little kids, in particular, fudge a bit. Maybe I've cleaned up my memories of those days, but I don't remember a time 
when we teased each other or left someone out. Sure, we squabbled and we had our conflicts, but that never stopped our play. We didn't remember from one day to the next those little conflicts. Now, I wonder if a grown-up had come out, what they might have done. They might have encouraged us and stressed us to have consistent rules. Maybe they would have encouraged us to finish one game before we stopped in the middle just because Katie didn't want to be it anymore. Maybe they would have taught us how to keep score. But that's not how we kids did things. If you asked us, why, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I doubt we could have told you. Maybe we would have just said, playing is fun. Or maybe we would have said, it feels good to be together. I think these times of play were enriching and joyful because we were together. We were experiencing the joy of community. Author Simon Sinek wrote recently a book called The Infinite Game. And because he helps organizations and leaders, he pays attention to how human beings interact. And he says that we people, all of us, we're all players in, in both finite and infinite games in our work and life. Now, finite games have a definite beginning and end, a fixed number of players, and agreed upon rules. They have scores and ranking and result in a winner. Think checkers or football or even an election is a finite game. In contrast, Synax sees that, that some scenarios in life are more like infinite games. They don't have a definite beginning or an end. They involve known and unknown players who might enter and leave the interactions at any time. Infinite games don't have universal set rules. And an infinite game doesn't have a conventional winner or loser. Now, the author shares this because he sees that there can arise substantial problems when people attempt to play an infinite game, no rules, no end, no winners, as if it is a finite game. What does that look like? What does that mean? Consider somebody in a marriage who wants to win a fight with their spouse. How many of you um, have ever walked away from a fight feeling like you wanted to win? Is that really what we want in a healthy marriage? I'm sorry, our, our tech folks are playing around here. Would you like me to switch to the other camera? Okay. They're, they're not going to give up yet. We've had a problem with this camera. I hope folks at home can hear my voice all right. But you can imagine in your mind's eye a husband and a wife in a fight. Is it really helpful to think of in terms of sides? Is that really how we want to think of it? Or consider a parent in the game of parenting. When does parenting end? Those of you who have children, does it end when they're 18 or 21? It's not my experience. I heard someone say never. These are times when it is not helpful to bring a finite mindset to the situations and scenarios that are infinite, no beginning, no end, no winners, no lunar losers. We as people of faith know that our spiritual journey is best approached, not like we're on a journey to win, but we're in it for a lifetime and beyond. It's an infinite game. Today, we heard a paragraph from the book of Acts. And the disciples 
the eleven have become twelve. And they have taken on a new role. They are now the apostles. And they are being intentional and focused on sharing their personal stories of what they saw and felt when Jesus was with them. And they tell whoever will listen what Jesus taught them. They share Christ's vision of what God wants the world to be like. They say what they saw the power of God do through Jesus, defeat death itself. And the apostle, apostles are inviting new folks to join the movement of followers of Jesus. Slowly, something informal but infinite is happening. Something simple but significant. More and more people are responding to the good news that they hear. A community is growing. Now, a community is not just a group of people in the same place at the same time. You know what that is? That's a crowd. No, a community is a group of people that have a connection. How do we know that these, these early church folks are becoming a community? There's no uniform that they wear. They don't have a lapel pin. How do we know who belongs to this growing team of followers of Jesus? They don't even have the name of Christians yet. They don't have that label. Whose rules are they following as they gather and come together? Jesus didn't leave them a manual. They don't have bylaws. What connects and drives and identifies this community? It's not really something, it's someone. And that someone is Jesus. This group is a collective of individuals who have seen the truth of God revealed in and through Jesus. They believe in Jesus. This community is bound by the power of a shared experience of faith. This community shares values and a vision that was imparted to them by Jesus Christ. We know they are a community because these Christ followers are practicing their faith in real and tangible ways together. They are collecting their goods and taking care of those who have needs. These practices are not obligations or a to-do list. These practices brought joy and gratitude. These practices define them as the community of God. In the spirit of togetherness, everyone who believed collected what they had of material wealth and they shared it. God was doing a new thing among them. It started small, but it grew and it grew and it kept growing and a community of faith became a religion and a people became a church and a movement became an institution. And we have to admit that sometime over the ages, there were times when that community, when our community lost sight of what should have been driving us and defining us. There were times and have been times in the Christian history of faith when we did not practice Christ-like faith. At times, we made up images of what we thought, what we decided was the right kind of Christian and what that Christian should look like. We thought it was our job to monitor who could earn God's love. Over the ages, some of the followers of Jesus stopped devoting themselves to the values and vision of the person of Jesus Christ and devoted ourselves to filling up church coffers. 
and filling in the pews. At the time, church practices like pick anything, replacing the wallpaper in the parlor, became more important than feeding the hungry person on our doorstep. Not always, not everywhere, but there have been times in our history as the community of Christ when we have lost sight of who we follow. The Presbyterian Church has its roots in the Reformation. We are a Presbyterian Church. 500 years ago, Christian communities looked at themselves and saw that they had gone astray, and they tried to right the ship. Did away with practices that were not Christ-like. In that time, the wisdom of our forebearers, the wisdom that they embraced, was this phrase. Not only that the church needed to be reformed, but always being reformed. They embraced the idea that the community of God was gathered around Christ, formed and shaped, sent out into the world, and that God wasn't done. That God would pull the community together, form it again, reform it, and again orient us to go out in the world and practice our faith centered on Christ Jesus. This is why that little paragraph from the book of Acts is important to us today. Because it reminds us of the little bit scary but deeply profound good news. That God is always forming and reforming and calling the community of Christ followers together again and again to practice our faith, to put our faith into practice. Today I want to remind us that our faith journey individually and collectively is an infinite game. We don't know how many players we have in our game. There are people across the globe right now who are Christians, who are on our team, trying to build and work for the world that God wants this world to be like the kingdom of God here on earth as in heaven. And there are people right outside our doors who aren't on our team today, but they could be tomorrow if we invite them to come and play along. Game, the game of faith, it changes, like our music and worship has changed over the years. And then in some ways the game doesn't change. There are still people in need who Jesus calls us to serve. Some things change and some things don't. The thing that we call faith, becoming a Christian, becoming Christ-like, that endeavor is never done. Not for us individually, not when we're 5 or 15 or 55 or 105. Friends, when is the game over? Only God knows. We are still carrying on the mission that Jesus gave to those apostles, those first disciples long ago. And it's not a burden. It's not a burden. It's a joy when we walk and play and worship and learn and grow and serve together. That is the joy. Today, I wish for you, I wish for you to be able to find and remember that you are part of something bigger than yourself, that you are on a journey of following Jesus, that your life has purpose, and there is so much for you yet to do. If you're at the beginning of the journey, so much joy to be had and to be shared. And if you're in a stage in life when you're thinking about God calling you home to join that great feast with all the saints, like my mom called us home for dinner on those dusky nights when I was a kid, you're thinking about the time when you will stop playing. Don't worry about your legacy. 
about your legacy here at this church, or about what you leave behind. That's infinite thinking. Only God knows what kind word you might have shared in your past, or lifted prayer, or treasure that you gave that may have taken root and touched somebody else's life. You can't know, but God does. God calls us to delight in the journey of faith and to do this journey together. Together doesn't mean just in one place at one time. We know that this morning. Some of us are here, some of us are in our homes. Together doesn't mean being in one place in time. It means that we share the values and vision of Jesus Christ and that we seek to show, to practice our faith as the Spirit moves among us and does something new here and now. And so my prayer is that we will practice our faith with renewed joy as we seek to touch the lives of those who have need. For this is the call of Christ Jesus. This is the call that we hear and that we are invited to come and join in. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to the great feast that this table reminds us of. This table and this meal is not my meal. It's not my supper. This is the Lord's Supper. This table is not a Presbyterian table. This table is the great table of God's grace and love, and all are invited. Come now and celebrate with us and remember the one whom we follow, 
the one who teaches us love upon love upon love. Will you join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving? The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you, O God, our thanks and praise. O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, you make for us a feast of rich food and well-aged wines, and you wipe away all tears and swallow up death forever. You are our God. We rejoice that you have come to save us. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the choirs of angels, with prophets and apostles and saints, and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Son, your, our Lord and your Son. On the first day of the week, you raised Jesus from the dead. Death could not destroy him. The tomb could not hold him. And now he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit forever. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, he took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took cup. filled with new wine he said this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this in remembrance of me remembering your gracious Acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate the rising and dying. As we await the day of his coming with thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be living and holy sacrifices dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith that Christ has died. Dying, you destroyed our death. Christ is risen. Rising, you restored our life. Christ will come again. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon the gifts of bread and wine before us at this table and in the homes of the congregation that joins in this great feast. As we break bread and bless cup, may this be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and with your church all over the world. And send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to show and to tell the good news to all the world that Christ our Lord is risen from the dead. Alleluia. Through Christ and in Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Together, let the people of God lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever comes to me will never thirsty. Whoever believes in me will never be hungry. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Alleluia. Amen. If you have brought your own communion, you are welcome to partake of it, but Pat and I will also be bringing around bread and wine, juice. Let us pray. God of glory, we give thanks to you for this feast of your goodness and grace. Send us out to share the bread of life with all who hunger for your love. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen.
Friends, at this moment, I just thank, uh, take a moment to thank those who have practiced their faith by giving their time and their talents and their treasures to this church. If you have sent in uh, your donations through the mail or through our online giving, uh, we give you thanks. We appreciate your support. And if you have not done so, we also um, invite you to continue to share the support of ministry here at First Presbyterian Church of Easton. If you're in this space, um, we are not passing the plate, but there is um, an offering plate at the rear of the sanctuary. Thanks be to God for God's generosity in all things. Amen. Our sending, the blessing that carry us, carries us out from this time of worship into the world, is not a sending from a place. It is an invitation to live out our faith in the world. And so I offer these words from Romans 8, 3, 38 through 39. As we go now in peace to love and to serve the Lord, remember For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. (laughs) 